I think the other thing really good CEO decision makers do, a little bit like a chess game. They think three, four, five, six moves ahead. Population health is much more doable when you have a health plan partner that's you know, aligned totally with the organization's objectives and goals. There's a time and a place for important decisions. And if you hesitate and you don't pull the trigger, you know, oftentimes you, you miss that decision and you miss that opportunity. Howard P. Kern is among the most innovative healthcare leaders in the country. Throughout his 42 years of healthcare management, he has a strong track record of executive leadership success. He served as president and CEO of Centara Healthcare from 2016 to 2022, and now serves as CEO Emeritus, advising the CEO and board of directors on strategy and policy issues and programs. You can try to partner with other health plans and that's certainly a way many organizations have done it, but having that total alignment makes a big difference. Centara Healthcare is a nationally top-ranked integrated health system headquartered in Norfolk, Virginia, with net revenues of 11 billion and 32,000 employees, including almost 1,400 physicians and advanced practice providers. In 1983, Kern developed and implemented the first provider-sponsored health plan in Virginia at Centara, and Centara Health Plan Insurance Division currently serves over 950,000 members. And we'll have to continue to use technology and artificial intelligence and analytics, uh, machine learning to really enable more efficiency. An expert on a wide range of hospital leadership topics, Howard Kern brings forth strong operational expertise across the healthcare continuum. Let's listen in as he shares what he's learned about effective leadership. Well, good afternoon, Howard, and welcome. Thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. We're pleased to have you at this microphone. You've certainly had a distinguished career as a leader, uh, being at uh, Centara Health for over 40 years. And why don't we kick off with, uh, you know, as you look back on your career, what were the major leadership lessons that you've taken away? Well, the, the most important and first one I uh, bring up, Gary, is humility. Uh, I would tell you that my success is almost uh, directly connected to my ability to have a great team to work with that does amazing things and uh, delivers on critical results. Uh, and I learned a lot of that from two great leaders before me that I worked for. Uh, Glenn Mitchell, who ran Centera back in the early, from early 70 all the way to 95, and then Dave Byrne, who followed Glenn and was my predecessor. And uh, I worked with both those guys and learned different things from both of them, but they both shared really great leadership lessons that uh, uh, I have really adapted mm -hmm. and into my own style. The other big one and for me you know, is the importance of ethics and trust uh, and in your ability to you know, not just talk about that, but role model it. You got to do that. And uh, too many people think that they can talk about it and set, the, set that expectation, but then they're cutting corners in their own behavior and their own leadership style. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't wash, not in my book. Uh, so that's very important. The other one that uh, I've always uh, focused on is the importance of uh, being a, a, an excellent decision maker. You, you can't hesitate sometimes and, and deliberate too long. There's a time and a place for important decisions. And if you hesitate and you don't pull the trigger, uh, oftentimes you you miss that decision and you miss that right. opportunity. And uh, oftentimes it's better to make a decision without 99.9% .9 of all the information you need, but then make a course correction along the way. That is, or, or even make a bad decision but and then fix it. Uh, but making no decision is worse, in my, my opinion, right. from a leadership perspective. As you think about your team, what were the main characteristics that you look for in a senior executive that would be uh, working for you, Howard? I look for uh, a couple of critical skills. I look for their ability to have, you know, have and, and take hold of and, and effectively communicate vision, direction, priorities. So they've got to be great communicators, and that includes the listening side. Uh, the other is... Uh, the ability to deliver consistent results. You know, I think the team has to be able to 
have confidence in each other. If somebody says they're going to do something, they actually can do it and they deliver on it. Then I think diversity is important, not just diversity of gender and ethnicity, but also diversity of thought and style is important when you're building the team. Uh, I look for that very much in, in how to build that team. It was very important to have all kinds of uh, points of view at the table and people be comfortable expressing those views. And ultimately you make a decision, but you at least have had good perspective. People that aren't comfortable sharing their point of view or taking the risk uh, aren't helping the team, frankly, if they're not doing that. Hmm. Now you made a successful move from being the chief operating officer to being the chief executive officer. Some aren't able to make that transition well. What did you see as the differences between being a COO and a CEO? What did you have to focus on as a CEO? First and foremost is the realization that as CEO, more so even than COO, you have to be comfortable, uh, not the implementer. You, you know, you're, you're the visionary, you're the setting of strategic priority and direction, but then your primary job is to motivate and, and, and focus on how the team functions. And certain CEOs like to be at the center and everything comes through them. Others have a more uh, distributed style where the team interacts and shares the executive on certain things, but otherwise goes on their own. You know, I, my style was the latter. Uh, I didn't need to be at the center of every communication and decision process. Wouldn't get much done that way. Uh, but it's very important to have the ability to, to, to do that and to be comfortable with it. If you've got to be at the center of every decision and drive every decision, that more COOs tend to be in that mode. Uh, as CEO, you can't do that. The other big responsibility the CEO has is to be more external. And mm. I think that's pretty much in the textbooks what you'll, you'll read about. External in the context of board relationships and building trust and, you know, and communicating with the board and in the community, you know, the, the stakeholders outside the organization, the health system. Very important for the CEO to play a very active role in building and sustaining relationships, trust, alignment with important stakeholder entities in the community. I think this discussion of decision making is really important, Howard. And do you think that some um, individuals just have that capability to identify the need for a decision and make it, whereas others seem to kind of struggle a bit? What What's your view of that? The, the ability to synthesize and understand certain facts and characteristics and environmental uh, dynamics and be able to associate them with other decisions and outcomes you've made is critical. And good executives that can make great decisions do that. You know, the decision may be a totally unrelated sector of the business or, or another critical area that's unrelated, but two or three or five years back, they had a similar situation with different kinds of circumstances, but you know, it had, it fits certain characteristics and they draw on those to say, you know, when I did this back there, back here, this is how it worked and this is what we did. I think the other thing, good C, really good CEO decision makers do, it's a little bit like a chess game. They think three, four, five, six moves ahead and figure out if I make this decision now, what are the critical uh, issues and impacts and how is this person gonna react and what are my competitors gonna do? And here is how I'm going to handle that. What was a really tough decision that you had to make, Howard, just thinking back on the last several years? Probably the, the toughest decision I had to make really in the last several years uh, it goes back to 2008, 2009 with the recession. I think that was the first recession that, that I saw both on the provider side and the health plan side where we were being impacted. Before that, I think everybody used to think healthcare was recession proof. Right. And I, I think really that recession, which was A, a very significant downturn for the country, and B, uh, we see the finally the effect of the sensitivity of the consumer to what they purchase and how they spend money. And back then they, they were making choices between getting food on the table and getting going to the hospital or going to a doctor or paying for their insurance premium. Uh, and that was a real wake up call for many of us. And 
I realized very quickly that we had to make critical decisions to respond and not financially fall off the cliff. And one of the things, the decision I made, and I, I was I, looking back on it, I feel very good about it, and because we've used it several times, we have never had a layoff at Centera. And that was a tough decision then because a lot of people were pressuring me to, on the board and elsewhere, shouldn't we be looking to do that? And I said, nope, we're not going to. And uh, it worked out fine. Let's build on your comment about the board. I know from past discussions that you think that the collaboration between the CEO and the board chair is fundamentally uh, important. Could you share your thoughts about that with us, please, Howard? Yes, absolutely. And it is a critical partnership that I have been very fortunate to have some great chairs that uh, understood that partnership and, and worked great together. I think the the CEO needs to be seen as the executive that runs your organization. And the board fundamentally sets policy, approves a strategy, uh, you know, is a big part of the external relationships in the community, uh, but is not running the organization. And I, I've had to remind board members here and there that they don't have the authority to spend any money at Centera. The bylaws don't give them that. They can ask me to do it. And technically and theoretically, I, I can decide not to, or I, I can agree with them. Obviously, if I don't agree and it's, they feel strongly about it enough, they'll get rid of me. But uh, fundamentally, the board doesn't have that authority. The board chair's role is to fundamentally lead the board, provide the guidance to the board about you know, strategy, policy level issues, community relationship priorities, and, and then doing that work with the CEO to execute on those priority areas. Uh, and to the extent that the board or the chair gets in the middle of operational issues, goes and meets with CEOs of other organizations, it really undermines the credibility and the effectiveness of the CEO. During the time that you have been at Centara, uh, pr particularly during the time you've been a COO and a CEO, the federal government has become the largest payer for healthcare and the largest regulator. How does that influence health system strategies? Uh, I think it's it's been a huge influencer, uh, particularly with the uh, Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare, and uh, the influence that's had both in Medicare and Medicaid and the availability of uh, insurance to those that otherwise couldn't afford it, the Medicaid expansion program. And it's been a, a very beneficial, I think, to the healthcare industry. The Medicaid expansion it's been a huge benefit to the, you know, Virginia. And it, yeah. we went for, you know, a dozen years without implementing it, uh, frankly, and we, sh we should have earlier, but the legislature and the governor got around to it. And uh, it's been a huge uh, enhancement in terms of access and better outcomes and health plan uh, involvement. And uh, I think Medicare also is, is critical for, a lot of people don't realize that Medicare, uh, when you get Medicare, okay, I'm covered, you're not. You know, you, Medicare gives you a lot of good coverage, but you still have a lot out of pocket. I think the whole area of dual eligibles is going to see a lot more growth. It's a fairly small piece of our total governmental business right now, but right now it's disproportionately getting more, doing most of the spending, the, the Medicare and Medicaid individuals, typically disabled, typically, uh, you know, either Medicare eligible or aging into Medicare with disabilities. Very complicated, you know, group to deal with. We're going to see more and more of that. You laid out a fabric of costs and affordability, which, of course, has become a bigger and bigger issue. Um, what options do health systems have to, to kind of deal with the cost of uh, care and the cost of labor and so on? I do think cost and affordability are intertwined, and we have to solve for the cost side so that we can retain access and affordability uh, for the population. I, I think on the labor side, two things come to mind. One is we've got to get our arms around this inflationary spiral we're in where the, our, the rates of, of pay continue to go up. I think some of the, the rates of pay were appropriate after the pandemic to re reflect the work and the complexity and, and dangers in working in a healthcare environment. Uh, but I think it's continuing to escalate and we have to fix the supply problem. And, and the other thing that I think is critical is to utilize technology and artificial intelligence and data analytics 
to allow our care people, care workers to work at the top of their license and, and their credentials. We, we have so much of what nurses, doctors, therapists, pharmacists do uh, that is not reflective of their skills. And, and we've got to change that. On the non-labor side, we're, we're in the midst of, I think, a transition from offshore manufacturing and offshore supply chain models that we learned during the pandemic were not reliable to more of onshoring. And I think we're going to have to let that transition flow and then start to tighten it down, if you will, with more competitive solutions and pricing and hope that the free market system will work. And we'll have to continue to use technology and artificial intelligence and analytics, uh, machine learning, uh, and a smarter level of electronic record uh, to really enable more efficiency. This leads us into the operating margin issue. And as you know, operating margins for health systems have been declining for multiple years. Uh, Centara has been very strong through the years. Um, how did you keep the operating margins so strong at Centara? I think first and foremost, it was a discipline of always being focused on managing our costs and our margins uh, proactively. Uh, it's easy to uh, to do it in the years of plenty, uh, but it's more challenging when they're tougher years. And through the pandemic, we were benefiting from both you know good discipline, stable performance, and uh, the government subsidies and support. Uh, the other thing I'll just tell you is our business model with the health plan and the provider side has been a real, uh, I think, strength to the organization economically. Uh, and I sort of liken it to a hedge fund kind of model internally where, uh, and sort of, it's, this, there's a lot of truth to this. When the hospitals are busy, they, they perform very well. Doctors perform very well. Health plan takes it on the chin a little bit because the health plan is paying out more fees. And then the, when things slow down, like we saw in the pandemic, the hospitals and the doctors take it on the chin, but guess what? The health plan is doing very, very well. So I think on balance, we tend to see the organization not having the wild swings, but having a nice consistent uh, pattern of strong performance. And both sides of the organization are contributing it in different ways at different times. The health plan you referred to as Optima Health, yep. and uh, there must be maybe 10 or 12 health system owned health plans of size, which Optima Health is. Um, there were probably early days when uh, mm -hmm. the board had to hang in there and yeah. and uh, support Optima Health. How important is Optima Health now? I mean, you made reference to it, but how important is Optima Health now to Centara? And will that continue in the future? Very important. It's a core part of our overall strategy and not just on the financial side, it's also part of our mission, also part of our effectiveness in delivering continuity and access across uh, populations. Population health is much more doable when you have a health plan partner that's you know, aligned totally with the organization's objectives and goals. I wanna go back to your comment though. There's no question that health plan provider organizations are few and far between successfully. And uh, the cultures there, I think for decades, uh, and, you know, we're not aligned. Uh, hospitals felt like they need to be able to give care. They saw health plans as just trying to skimp on care and just put more profits into the insurance company coffer. The insurance companies thought that hospitals and doctors were just wasting and didn't care about the accountability to cost and, and performance. And, and they needed to rein in these crazy providers and, and take costs out of the system. And we had to live within that, you know, mindset. Uh, and I think that was existing, coexisting within the organization. Uh, one of the things I did when I, 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 I led the implementation of the health plan back in 82 ah. and 83. One of the biggest things I heard is you've got to keep the health plan and the hospital, not just ideologically separate, but physically separate <laughs> and not let them co-mingle co because that cultural clash is so big. And, uh, and we did that. And it was a big I think today it's very different. I think we can we can create more alignment because there's more alignment elements in the way the Affordable Care Act and and uh, managed care is working in population health and other things. 
The other thing that I, I think we did learn and is you've got to stay with it long term. It's a long term strategy. Howard, how about consolidation? Hospitals have been consolidating for 30 years, basically. Um, and we're still seems like we're still seeing that as a priority. What do, what do you think? Is this going to continue for the foreseeable future? I think it's it's an interesting dynamic that's going on, Gary. I I believe in consolidation, but only upon you know, a, a couple of critical elements that there's a good cultural alignment, that there's a, a, a sound uh, strategy that makes sense from a community perspective, business perspective, economic perspective, and uh, and that there's a, a clear roadmap to getting those the strategy executed and the values created. Many too many much many many mergers don't do that, uh, and I think we've seen a number that uh, have I think been counterproductive and end up breaking yeah. down. The real value I, I see getting that we've gotten out of strategic you know, implementation of mergers has been the ability to create uh, uh, regional networks that make sense, the ability to really tap great resources across the organization. Uh, mergers a lot of times bring skills and competencies to the table that create more value for the organization, board and, and management and clinical leadership. And then the last, I, I think that mergers, if they're done right, you can get economies of scale, not just of you know of back office, but also in terms of clinical and health plan business. You've got to, but you've got to, executing is very important. Howard, are you concerned about all of these large cap companies, the CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, now Amazon, elbowing their way into primary care? Are you concerned about that as it affects health systems? I, I am. I, I'm seeing them doing that in a major way. They're already executing on it. And I think um, both the health plan side and the big pharma side are very well capitalized. These are huge companies with you know significant resources. And then you throw in Amazon and Walmart, you know, they're not exactly small time either. Uh, and the big question is whether they'll figure out a, a more effective model and, and execute on that model for working with physicians. There's a big debate in, in the hospital industry, oh, they're, they're biting off more than they can chew. And, you know, do doctors can't be made to be efficient enough and productive enough. And you can't keep them long enough to get the value out of that upfront end purchase. Um, I think uh, some of these uh, organizations will figure that out. Howard, as expected, this has been an absolutely terrific interview. We appreciate your being with us. I've got one last question, if I could. Over the years, you've, I'm sure, counseled many, many up and coming leaders. What kind of advice do you give an upcoming leader? These young people out there, they're so energetic and they're so idealistic. You don't want to discourage any of that, but you want to hopefully give them a little focus. Uh, the best advice I give young leaders is to look at their career from a planning perspective on two fronts. One is the professional front and the other is their personal life perspective. And it's all up to them. There's nobody else to be accountable to for this but them, um, themselves. But uh, on the professional side, I sort of liken their career, their career uh, to a, again, I'm going back to a chess game. And if you think about chess, there's the opening game, mid game, and end game. And I said, you got to think about your career in that context. And the opening game has certain components where you want to get a lot of different experiences, maybe two to three year uh, assignments and really build a foundation of experience. The mid-career gets you focused to where you think you want to go and lines that up and, and you get a couple of longer term assignments in, in, a, in a component of the profession that you like and you think you'll be good at. And that positions you for the end game, which is the you know your career defining uh, areas like COO, CEO was for me. On the personal side, I talked to them about the importance of figuring out your own personal life. What, what is important to you there? If you're going to get married and have a family, you, you know, you got to decide this, but where do you fit that in all of this? And, and, or, you know, how do you want to, you know, balance your personal interests against your professional interests and have some balance in the end. Howard, thank you again. Just terrific. We really have benefited from your wisdom. Well, my pleasure, Gary. And thank you for uh, asking me such nice softball questions. Ha, ha, ha.